Which came first, the chicken or the dim bulb egg? Maybe even the variac. Stay tuned and we'll find out. Well, greetings everyone and welcome to today's episode of Test Bench Tech Tips. Try saying that 10 times in a row. <laughs> hey, if you're setting up a new test bench or upgrading a current one, there are three things you really need to consider uh, incorporating into your design, and that is an isolation transformer, a variac, and a current limiter. Some people call them a dim bulb tester, and uh, those three things will really uh, benefit you and add a lot of safety and convenience uh, to your workload. And uh, unless you want to end up being a graduate of the James Bond School of Electrical Safety, Shocking. Seriously, uh, these three items will really improve the safety and functionality of any test bench. And uh, I want to uh, uh, take a closer look at them and uh, show you what sequence you want to hook them up in because there is a particular order that you should do those things in and uh, uh, for your own good and for the uh, longevity of some of the equipment that you're working on. So let's just slide on over to the test bench. Okay folks, I'm going to give away the game here just a little bit and show you the sequence from left to right the way uh, these devices should be uh, connected together. Uh, number one on the hit parade is the uh, isolation transformer. Now it uh, is plugged, I plug mine directly into the wall of course and uh, from there, uh, it has three taps on the back. One of them is 120 volt AC, it's the center one. That is complete, well, all three of them are completely isolated from the primary, but the secondary has 120, I think 110 on this one, and probably 125 to 130 on this one. But since, uh, the voltage at my home here runs around 120 volts. We'll just leave it at that and put it in 120. And from there, we go over to the uh, Variac, which is number two on the list of sequence. And we'll uh, discuss that one here in just a few minutes. And uh, after that, I want to uh, bring your attention to the dim bulb tester up here on the wall. I don't want to take it off the wall, but... Uh, it's right here and uh, I've made it out of a duplex outlet and I will show the schematic to that. It's it's quite simple. It has a bypass switch on the left side so uh, if you want to bypass your current limiter uh, you can do that with a switch because if the bulb you select has a little bit uh, too much of a voltage drop on it you can bypass that. That way uh, you can get full full line voltage to it. But uh, that's the way that looks. And uh, so uh, now you don't have to go through the rest of the video to wonder how we stuck these together. <laughs> let's, uh, let's discuss the uh, uh, transformer and why you need one. And we'll switch cameras and uh, go to my uh, low tech old school drawing. Well, here's my pictorial diagram complete with stickman image uh, for reference. Now, I wanted to give you an idea of the uh, what the U.S. power grid is like and the way homes are wired up. And uh, the importance of having a third wire ground uh, as opposed to no ground, uh, the way things used to be. But uh, originally when... Uh, our power grid started out, uh, we did have a third wire ground, but it wasn't at the house. It was uh, out here at the telephone pole. Now, the uh, uh, main grid came in usually on, on, the, on the top bar of the pole. Uh, it generally uh, was running at, say, 13,000 volts, and it would go into a step-down transformer. 
and you've all seen these, uh, they're everywhere. About every other house around here has one. And what you probably never noticed that uh, part of the secondary of this transformer, as well as it going into the house, also has a ground wire that comes out here, and it is tacked to the side of the telephone pole and goes deep down into the ground, probably to the bottom of uh, where the post is. And this is a uh, safety ground, mostly for uh, lightning protection, because when you have this size of a power grid throughout the whole town, it makes a great antenna for lightning strikes. And if you get a lightning strike, even if it's five miles across town it's you're still wired into the same place so if you have a uh, you know if it comes through any part of the grid it's a conductor and it will eventually find its way into your home without some kind of protection and so what they did in their infinite wisdom many years ago was they just grounded uh, usually it's a center part and sometimes you'll see the uh, the wire on top of the pole uh, in case of a direct lightning strike it could be blood off the ground now, when you bring this uh, power from the secondary uh, into your home, it is usually done by a uh, 240-volt line. Uh, there are three wires that come in, three conductors. Uh, now, I've, I've separated these for clarity because uh, these days and ever since the 1950s, they've been in a twist for your service drop coming from the pole to your home, but I'm going to separate them for clarity. And uh, you will see that uh, the outside conductors, uh, if you measure between these two, uh, you will get 240 volts AC. And if you measure from the ground or uh, center, which is uh, usually it is a bare uh, aluminum wire, from the center to the outside, you'll get your 120 volt AC. And also again, from the center to this other one, you will get 120 volts AC. So uh, series together, you end up with 240 volts AC for your dryers and air conditioners, furnaces, uh, uh, stoves, cook stoves. But your uh, inside wall receptacle uh, will be pulled from the center, what they call the neutral, to the one of the lines from either this side or this side. <clears throat> now, as I said before, that uh, in the 1950s, uh, there were very few uh, receptacles that have a third wire ground on them. Everything was uh, two wire two pin and line and neutral and they weren't uh, distinguished between each other any more than uh, your left and your right hand. So uh, you could plug an appliance in here and it wouldn't be any problem, but if it developed a fault of some kind, say your refrigerator uh, developed a short circuit in it and part of the uh, line came in contact with the uh, frame or casing of the refrigerator, uh, you wouldn't know it until you touched it. And if you were standing, say, on a wet cement floor or something, or you touched another appliance that was grounded, uh, you would complete the circuit from the hot down through the ground right back to the telephone pole ground. And this is why, this is the dangerous part of this. And so, uh, I can't remember what year it would have been in, but sometime during, during the 50s, we started to convert over to a three-wire uh, receptacle, uh, like you see now uh, everywhere. And the pins are a little smaller, the line being the smaller blade of the two, the neutral being the, lo the longer blade. And the ground is tied to the ground of your uh, service entrance uh, before your breaker box, or they take into call them, calling them load centers now. And that ground is also tied to neutral. So essentially, your third wire ground is tied directly to your neutral. And you, it's usually back at the uh, 
uh, breaker uh, box. Now, some, some receptacles are also tied inside the receptacle to ground. Uh, some are not. Uh, some you have what they call an isolated ground, uh, usually used in hospitals and, and uh, places where uh, having a, uh, and computer rooms where having a uh, third, uh, third wire ground uh, was essential and not having it tied together would be a, a problem. So those are the only two places I know of that use that type of receptacle. And they're usually uh, indicated with a, a orange triangle somewhere on the duplex part of the, of the uh, receptacle box. Uh, again, that being said, uh, if uh, you, uh, you can still receive uh, quite a substantial electrical shock just by touching the hot line or the, the line wire and anything that is uh, attached to ground, be it the floor, be it another appliance, or uh, uh, whatever. So uh, from that, we can uh, determine that uh, maybe we should get rid of the ground. Maybe that would help a lot of things. Well, we really can't because back here at the pole, it's always going to be grounded. And whether you take the ground off, uh, which I don't recommend, at, at the outside entrance of your home or anywhere else, you're still going to have a return path back here to complete the circuit. And if you're the guy that happens to complete the circuit, uh, you become an instant fuse. He's dead, Joe. And we don't want that. So uh, enter the isolation transformer. A short disclaimer before we get too far along in this video is uh, I want to caution you, if you are not comfortable with working around high voltages or electricity, electronics, uh, please find someone that is, uh, someone that's uh, worked in the field a long time and uh, knows what the pitfalls can be uh, if you get across the wrong wires. And, uh, but if you are comfortable, and I'm taking for granted that you are since we are discussing building test benches, uh, obviously you are uh, comfortable around electricity and, and really love working with it. So uh, we'll just head on from there. And uh, if you're not, uh, go ahead and find someone that is that can help you. All right, so with that out of the way, let's uh, talk about the isolation transformer. This one's mine. I bought it uh, at a garage sale for, I think, $2 many years ago. And uh, it's, a, it's a pretty good-sized transformer. Uh, if you put your hand here, it's about that uh, big. And it, uh, as far as capacity goes, it's rated at 350 volt amps. Now, that's a little bit different in watts. Volt amps usually comes into play when we're talking about a inductive load. And since we are talking about transformers, which are inductive, and going into a uh, 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 variac over here, uh, which is highly inductive, uh, we'll probably stick with the VA rating of the transformer. Uh, watts. Uh, equates to a purely resistive load and so there are some differences we'll talk about that later on in the video or in a separate video of how to calculate that but this is rated at 350 VA and for me it's been very good I've had this uh, for several years and uh, it has served me very well I haven't found anything I couldn't plug into it and overload it even my 350 watt Swan ham radio uh, does just fine on this thing. Uh, it has three output taps. Uh, the center one is the one I use the most. It uh, delivers 120 volts AC. And uh, the other ones are, one is I think 110 and the other one's like 125. But for the most part I use the 120 volt AC one. Okay, so here's a schematic of uh, my setup, and uh, we're just going to start here with the uh, uh, AC plug that goes into your uh, receptacle on your wall, and that, of course, is connected to the city power grid. Now, our purpose here is to isolate ourselves from that, and so as you see, as the, uh, the current comes in here to the primary winding, 
it sets up a magnetic field within the transformer and it comes out here on the secondary winding of the very same voltage, 120 volts. And that gives us our isolation. There is no way that you can uh, create a direct circuit back to that ground out there on the power transformer on the telephone pole. If you go through this using the secondary winding, you touch any one of these and touch ground, you will not have a connection back to the uh, ground of the city power system. So that's basically how the isolation transformer works. It's not to say you won't get shocked if you touch both of these at the same time, you certainly will. But uh, as far as an accidental ground, uh, you're completely isolated using this method. So why use the isolation transformer first instead of the Variac? Now you can do that. You can put the Variac first in line and the isolation transformer second, but I have found out that it works better the, the, way, the way I have it drawn out here because the transformer was designed to run at 120 volts input to it. And if you put that behind the Variac and say bring it up to maybe one third of the voltage, the transformer won't develop enough counter EMF and will begin to heat up a little bit and could eventually burn out if you had it on there long enough, uh, which is the reason why electric motors and compressors and things tend to burn out when you have a brownout in your house because they can't develop enough counter EMF to uh, lower their current draw and eventually will burn up. So I recommend you put it in first, then the Variac. The other reason is that I have found that for some reason, when you put the Variac first, you don't get a linear um, output from it. You can start at zero voltage, and as you turn up the Variac, the voltage may rise slowly to a point and then you'll keep turning it up and turning it up and finally it'll just shoot on up there to full output voltage. So it depends on the load. But I have found that if you put the isolation transformer first, then the Variac, it, it works much better. Now let's say you're setting up your super fabulous 21st century test bench and you want to do it the right way. You don't want to get things out of sequence or to where it won't work or function the way you hope it will. And uh, I want to tell you that you do not want to uh, connect any of your test equipment beyond this point. Just leave it completely off your isolation transformer and variac circuit. Uh, there's, there's certainly no need to come over here and uh, uh, adjust the voltage to the input of your test equipment that would be counterproductive so just leave it off plug it into your uh, wall receptacle and uh, have all your test equipment share a common ground from that wall receptacle that way all your readings will be stable and you'll have a minimum of noise introduced into your system now uh, if you don't have an isolation transformer uh, Here's a, a point of interest that you might want to know about, and it, it burnt me many, many times uh, in my youth before I uh, bought one of these uh, transformers, is that if you're working on a piece of equipment, say an old radio or a, a guitar amplifier that doesn't share or doesn't have a power transformer in it, and it develops some kind of fault inside to where you, uh, excuse me, one leg of your uh, power plug happens to short to the chassis. And this can happen uh, with a wiring fault or a ground fault, or it could happen if the so-called death capacitor shorts out and you happen to energize that chassis with 120 volts because of that fault. Now what's gonna happen when you take your favorite oscilloscope and you come over here and you wanna do some tests 
and uh, you uh, touch this ground to the chassis that's that's hot and you can guess what's going to happen the sky will light up with fireworks and and it will truly startle you uh, especially the first 10 times it happens to you and uh, so the isolation transformer will completely eliminate that problem uh, if you don't have one and you again if you touch touch these together you're going to at the very minimum blow the ground lead right off your test probe and uh, not only that you will probably blow the front end of your favorite oscilloscope here and that can become quite expensive so we really don't want to do that and uh, so use the isolation transformer keep your test equipment on the primary side of it and keep only what you want to um, put on your bench for troubleshooting into the secondary next up in our power chain will be the variac as you can see here it comes directly off the secondary of the isolation transformer and uh, I obtained mine several years ago uh, it's a Tenma and I bought it at a garage sale for five dollars you can still see the sticker on it there I haven't got rid of that yet and it works very well uh, the control is on the top here and you can vary the voltage from uh, 0 up to uh, 130 volts depending on the load and it has an ammeter in the front that uh, can measure quite the uh, current rating up to 15 amps on it which uh, I've never exceeded that much uh, sorry about the crack in it, but uh, what do you expect for five dollars? Uh, I was able to repair that. I just took a little hot pin and, and stop drilled it with a hot pin right there. And uh, it has a uh, single uh, ungrounded power plug and uh, again a single ungrounded receptacle on the side here. Now a Variac is, and sometimes it's confused with a, uh, uh, another device uh, called a rheostat, and I, I want to assure you that uh, they are not comparable at all. A Variac works entirely different, and I have one uh, up here on my top of my bench that uh, has the cover off of it, and this one came out of a uh, hospital diagnostic machine and uh, you can see it's a uh, instead of the uh, rheostat which it basically is uh, a whole bunch of turns of nichrome resistance wire around a ceramic core well a variac uh, has a uh, copper wire around a uh, metal ferrite core which uh, has a whole lot of uh, different characteristics to it. If you hook the Variac to a ohmmeter, and which I did here, and we're reading about uh, two ohms, and I'm sitting, well, we'll turn it all the way off here, and you can see where the tap is. It's going from one to the center uh, arm. And as you sweep that arm around, you'll notice that the meter doesn't move. And I'm turning it right now, as you can see, like so. But uh, the meter uh, doesn't budge. It, it may flip up a little bit because of uh, I need to clean the contact on this, but it, it never ends up more than, than two ohms total. For it. All right, now I put the camera down and I've uh, switched the uh, leads on the ohmmeter to the rheostat here. I'm going to show you what happens when you sweep the arm on this one and just watch the meter there. It goes clear over to, uh, in this case, um, probably uh, 75 ohms on this one 
So you can see the difference between uh, this rheostat and a, and a real live variac. They work entirely different. And uh, so the uh, variac works on inductance, whereas the rheostat works on resistance. And um, you really want to use a variac when you're doing things like this. And now for number three in the power chain, is our current limiter, sometimes called a dim bulb. As you can see here, I have mine mounted on the wall up out of the way of my workspace, so uh, it will be more of an attention getter if something goes wrong. And it is plugged directly into the output of my Variac, which is plugged into the output of the isolation transformer and that of course is plugged into the wall receptacle. So now we have the chain of events here is wall receptacle, isolation transformer, variac, and dim bulb current limiter. Now I'm going to hook all this up to give you a little demonstration of it and I'm going to plug in this 200 watt bulb into my dim bulb receptacle there. And we'll put the switch on lamp so we know that it is indeed in series with what our load will be. And the load will be this unique looking bulb. And it's a 60 watt bulb. And we'll plug him in right there. So now I've got the Variac turned on. It's all energized and we'll start advancing the, the meter here. And you can watch up here the voltage rise i know it's a little small but we'll, we'll try to blow that up later and you can see the lamp come alive now you will also notice that the dim bulb is not lighting up at all it's because it is 200 watts and our load is 60 watts and the load is taking up the majority of the voltage here and we'll give it all the way up to, to full 120 volts. And uh, I think you can see this. The dim bulb is just starting to glow slightly. That way, if we happen to have a short circuit in our device that's under test, which would be this right now, the dim bulb will limit the current and I'm going to demonstrate that I've got a what I call a suicide cord here and it is a direct short and I am going to plug that in and it is going to create a direct short here and I'll show you how the dim bulb will uh, protect you here we go it's going to go in right now there we go and you can see it's quite bright And our output voltage up here has fallen to zero because it is a direct short and it's not reading anything. So I'm gonna unplug this now. And that's a demonstration of how the dim bulb current limiter works. Now, you may be wondering, well, what size uh, bulb should I put in here? And that's a really good question. It uh, as you can see here, I had this 60 watt load worked quite well with this uh, 200 watt bulb. Now I'm going to put in a 100 watt bulb into the current limiter. And you, you'll notice the voltage spiked way up here about a, almost 140 volts. So I'm going to turn this down. And we will plug the lamp back in. Okay, so now we have a 60 watt load and a going through a 100 watt uh, limiter. And you can probably guess what's going to happen. And uh, as I advance the voltage here, we'll see we're coming up. There's 50 volts right there. And nothing is okay, it's just 
barely starting to glow. I don't know if that's might be part of this reflection, but okay, I'm going to advance this clear up to okay, we are up to 100 volts and it's the max I can get out of it now because what's happening is this load is taking 100 volts and the current limiter is limiting the current and it is taking up the remainder of that which is probably about 30 more volts. So this would not be a good bulb to use if you're working on a small table radio or something that's around 50 watts. Uh, I'm sorry, if you're working on something that's greater than 60 watts because it's going to share share the load and you don't want to do that. It's better if you just take that out and put yourself in a, about 150 to 200 watt dim bulb. So now you see that uh, the dim bulb is glowing just very slightly and we're right at 120 volts. And I like to use a clear dim bulb because you can you can see the filament uh, a lot better than you can on a frosted white bulb. So. Now you don't have to incorporate any of these features in your design, but I guess there are worse things than being found dead at your workbench. He was worse than dead. His brain is gone. Well, that should just about do it for this video on which came first. The chicken or the variac? And of course, it's the chicken, just as God created it. Thanks again for watching. I hope you enjoyed the show. Meanwhile, I'm going to go up and check the ground on my transformer. Oh!